Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Joni Douglas Chavis from the F.D. Bluford Library at North Carolina Agricultural and Technical State University. I'd like to thank you for joining us, taking time out of your busy schedule today. And I will be the program moderator for our ACRL VAL program, Beyond Words, Initiating, Implementing, and Sustaining Change. This is brought to you by the subcommittee of that committee, led by Monica Chavis, with members Dr. Beata Gersh, Joanne Murphy, Spencer Brayton, Patrick Tomlin, and myself. I'd like to introduce you to our invited panelists. We have Dr. Romelia Salinas. As the Dean of Library and Learning Resources at Mount San Antonio College, she is responsible for the library, learning resources, and oversees the college tutoring services, and several areas which include the Faculty Center for Learning and Technology. A highlight of her work has been the establishment of the East Los Angeles Archive, dedicated to preserving the social and political history of that community. She is the president-elect of Reforma. Welcome, Dr. Salinas. I'd also like to welcome Ioni T. Damasco. She is the Associate Dean for Inclusive Excellence, Engagement and Operations for the University Libraries at the University of Dayton, where they strive to ensure inclusive excellence as being a deeply embedded framework within the libraries, providing leadership, guidance, and support for diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives, as well as outreach and engagement efforts across all libraries. Ioni works as the chair of the University Library's Diversity and Inclusion Team. She is a member. She also is a part of the Dialogue Zone Steering Committee, which is dedicated to programming and other campus initiatives around different forms of dialogue that take place in a library space called the, li the Dialogue Zone. Their scholarship is centered on race and diversity issues in librarianship, as well as the utilization of dialogue techniques to facilitate learning focused on social justice outcomes in libraries. Also joining us on the panel is Christina Fuller Gregory. She is a librarian. She describes herself as a librarian maker and experienced faculty for equity, diversity and inclusion and social justice practitioner. She is the assistant director of libraries in the South Carolina Governor School for the Arts and Humanities. She's also the principal consultant at Fuller Potential Counseling Consulting. She's an active member and is a 2017 ALA Emerging Leader and currently serves as a program facilitator for the Emerging Leaders Program. She has served as co-chair of the Public Library Association, Equity, Diversity, Diversity and Inclusion and Social Justice Committee, and is a current member of the ALA EDI Assembly. She, is, she sits on several advisory boards and groups, the new face of library makerspaces and the library journal Journals Equity in Action series. She was named as a 2021 Library Journal Mover and Shaker. Welcome, Christina Fuller Gregory. And welcome, panelist Dr. Jamika Piper. She's a humanities librarian at Indiana University, Purdue. University, Indianapolis. Her PhD work in English has a broad focus on African-American literature and culture, as well as dual specialties in Black feminism and genre fiction, focusing on public digital humanities while pursuing the MLIS. She serves as a humanities librarian and an adjunct instructor, instruction of the Africana Studies Program. She has formally served as the chair for African-American Funnel Project from 2017 to 2019, and was a recipient of the ACRL Scholarly Communications Research Grant in 2019. She also led the DEI subcommittee for the ACRL Awards Task Force in 2021. Her primary research interest includes informa informational justice, BIPOC faculty, and scholarly communication. Welcome, Dr. Pike. So, I want to just give you a few rules that we want to follow. Of course, we like to ask you to put any questions that you have directly into the chat, and we will handle those at the end of the program. I also would like for you to know that if you are a member um, of the 
Black, Indigenous, BIPOC group, any other area, whether it's Latinx, Asian, any other people of color, we would like for you to put an asterisk beside your chat because we want to make sure that we, are, we get to those that we feel are marginalized voices to answer their questions first. Any questions that we don't get to, we will make sure that we send them out with the transcript so that everyone can share in those answers. We are going to use, that's continued, uh, that's called the stack method and that's what we're going to use to answer the questions. We are want to be, have a safe space and we want to center our discussion around those marginalized voices. So um, we don't necessarily have a, an order of the questions. So I think we, our panelists have decided which ones they are specialists and want to speak with. So I'll ask the question, the panelists can respond and then everyone can chime in. All right, thank you. So my first question, BIPOC voices are underrepresented in the library world. Additionally, BIPOC library workers are often must carry added invisible labor when it comes to diversity, equity, inclusion, and social justice efforts. This includes the panel today. How do you balance sharing your voice and taking on additional responsibilities or free labor? What advice would you give for others who experience the same dilemma? What advice would you give to white librarians in order to best support you? Um, I, I, I could take the lead on first answering this question, if that's okay. Um, so I, I would first like to just say, let's first recognize that doing this work is hard and it's challenging. It can become overwhelming at times and it involves a lot of emotional labor, right? I, I think we're all aware of this, but I, I just kind of wanted to put it out there that this is hard work. And yes, oftentimes it's, there are activities and things that we're passionate about, but it's outside of our main responsibilities. In some way it ends up, um, because of our passion, we, we get involved and we do what we feel needs to be done to serve our student populations, community populations, whatever it might be. Um, so it is overwhelming, it is difficult. Some of the things that I have learned, some of the strategies I have learned over the many years that I've been in, in, in the profession, um, one is having a clear idea of what areas you're passionate about because you can't do everything. And I think that sometimes it's hard to understand that or just say like, okay, what am I gonna focus on? So having a clear idea of what is it that you want to give your labor to or your emotional uh, labor to helps. Um, when you have a focus, it allows you to set limits for yourself. And that helps in balancing the work. Um, but trying to find that balance is not necessarily easy. Uh, for example, early on in my career, I was very passionate about learning and presenting and talking about services to the Latinx community. And so I would go and I would agree to serve on panels and I would agree to go give lectures in, in, in LIS classes and I would do workshops and, and I gave a lot of my time. However, at some point I became disillusioned and I found that I felt or I found that people weren't necessarily listening to what I was sharing. Um, and it wasn't just me. I felt like other people who oftentimes were with me on these panels, their voices weren't all um, being appreciated either. And at some point, and I think uh, I remember being on a panel maybe about 19, 18 years ago at a state conference where I was speaking about um, services to Latinx students along with others who were speaking about services to other underserved populations. And at the end, attendees were, attendees were making comments that um, really spoke to their, their inability to listen to what we're saying, or I don't know if it's inability is the right way, or, but it just, it was like the comments they were saying showed me that they were missing the points of our presentations. And I have to say the disappointment was great. And I, at that point, I decided I wasn't going to do these kind of lectures anymore. I didn't want to put myself out there. Um, I, I, so I decided, and I took a break for a very long time that, um, I didn't want to do that kind of equity work. And 
Um, I, and I shifted my equity work to other spaces where I felt my work was more valued and was making a difference because I think that's what we all want to do, feel like we're making a difference. A second strategy that may be uh, in, in regards to how to manage the workload is to share the workload. I have been very fortunate to have many people who have worked with me, who have supported me, who have guided me. Having mentors is absolutely you know, essential for our success or our well-being. So looking for others who share your passion and perspectives is another way of managing that workload. Um, but again, like I said earlier, equity and, and inclusion and diversity, it, it's, hard, it's hard work. So you wanna build yourself a team and work with that team in as you select what you want to take on. Um, I guess the other one, other piece of advice is to remember, and I don't think this is necessarily, we hear this over and over, but it's so easy to forget when you are very passionate about service to your communities. Um, remember to take care of yourself. Um, I have seen many people give so much of themselves and which is beautiful but they don't always make time for themselves. And so maybe they don't get that promotion or they don't get that tenure or because again, we're not always, um, our, that value, that labor we do is not always recognized and valued within the, our institutions. Um, so make sure you don't lose sight of yourself as you're trying to serve your community. Um, don't miss out your time with your family. Take care of yourself, your physical health. I think I, I know I'm not very good at that. I struggle with that every day, trying to make sure I make the doctor's appointments and so on. So, so just make sure they're good to yourself as you try to create change in your community. Um, yes, I think that that was it. Can I kind of, okay, can I speak now a little bit? I think that that was Ramilia. I hope I'm pronouncing it right. Yeah. She just hit on like the three major things that I think are super important for um, or the points I think they're super important for this first question. So a little bit about my story. Um, I think I'm the only one on this panel right now that's actually not in a leadership position. So I, I actually just submitted my dossier this morning. So I'm not even fully tenured. But that aside, I think the way I think that we've been taught to think about service as librarians is that all service work is something that we must do. We must say yes all the time. We must um, constantly be in a position of giving. <laughs> and I think that one of the things that I had to learn um, over my start here is to say no and to be empowered. It is okay to say no. Like, it's so weird to me to be like, you know, I feel guilty for saying no, but I learned, had to learn to say no. I had to learn to draw boundaries. And I'll talk a little bit about that. So when I, in my role, um, before becoming the African-American uh, liaison, I did a lot of outreach to um, like the multicultural center, to places that had a diversity focus, diversity equity focus. I was really trying to build close relationships, trying to get in to work with students. And, you know, after about four years of doing that, I didn't have very much to show in terms of actual relationships with people. Um, it would be like, you know, kind of like Ramoya was saying, like people would stop and they would listen a little and they were like, oh yeah, we do agree that, you know, it's important. It's also important that you being a librarian of color and having a population, a student demographic that also is highly you know we have a lot of plcs on this campus so we understand that visibility as far as that goes is also important but in terms of actual opportunities to engage with students different like programs or workshops i wasn't getting much and i kind of also kind of end up withdrawing from that mode of engagement but i realized when i shifted so for me my focus is more kind of like okay if i can't do anything at least right at the moment, I couldn't with on the grounds. Um, how can I leverage my skills? First off, what are my skills? Um, and how can I leverage those? And that led me actually to doing instruction. So I was able to become an adjunct in the Africana Studies program 
because I have this genre of fiction background. And so they asked me to create a course on Afrofuturism for them that I've now taught for two semesters. And, you know, it's seeing steadily, um, it's a high draw, I guess what you call it, a high draw course. So student enrollments is looking really awesome. And so in doing that work, I'm able to directly work with students of color. I'm also able to sort of shape some of the curriculum within the program directly. So this is speaking to Ramilia's point about how doing the work that has an impact. I see that there's impact there. The other thing is like through my service work specifically. Um, so being the chair of the African-American Funnel, um, serving locally in different capacities, I become I become a lot more strategic about what services I choose. And also how can I, and thinking more strategically about how I can fold those into um, ways that'll benefit me. Cause you know, it's a little bit mercenary. I know that, but like, you know, if I'm going to do service work, it has to have some sort of project outcome. So when it comes to helping me set my priorities, um, if you look at like the task force, there's a report that came out. These are direct things that will affect the ACRL awards distribution. Um, when you think about the subject funnel, I can say, look, um, because of my leadership, I was able to do to create these new um, subject terms that will now be applied or now right, you're able to apply for any kind of collection relative to African-American history, life, culture, or study. So it has a direct and immediate outcome. Um, but yes, I'm sorry, I feel like I blathered on, but the point here is one, say no, being empowered to say no, and also being empowered to set those boundaries. And if possible, feeling finding ways to make it clear that the work you do um under the dei and social justice umbrella are not separate from the core focus of the job that you've been hired to do and i'll stop blathering right now well thank you so very much dr Parker piper those are really good suggestions i will add that one of the questions that I have of dr salinas and we will put those in the chat and have her answer she mentioned a uh, building a team. And so we'd like to get some information from any panelists at the end of the program about what who's on the team, what does the team look like when you're new and you're coming in and you're trying to get those people around you to help you. Okay, so we're going to move to the next question, keeping abreast of the time. Since completing your spotlight, and what I'd like to remind everyone is that all of our panelists have done a VAL spotlight. So you may, may, may or may not have seen it, but they have all done a spotlight. How has your situation changed since completing a spotlight? Do you think that the COVID-19 era has had an impact on your DEI and social justice work? And if you feel that it has, how so? Okay, so I think I was um, tagged to, to sort of take the lead on this question. Um, so it was interesting. My spotlight was published in June of last year. Um, and I had just been appointed into the role that I'm in right now um, when it was posted. Um, I'm the associate dean at my library. Um, and being a new associate dean also meant that the portfolio for this position was completely reconfigured with when the previous associate dean retired. So inclusive excellence is now a very prominent part of my portfolio. It's in my title. Um, it, it elevates, um, I think, in terms of visibility, but also like institutional priorities, that inclusive excellence is part of, you know, we're committed to it. It's, you know, there's in my having this position means there's accountability at the top for making sure that we're following through what we say state our values are so i'm still finding my way <laughs> in terms of being an administrator um, in terms of you know figuring out like i'm building this job as i'm, I'm going through it um, but one of the big things that we've done is um, we recently completed a diversity strategic planning process um, we finished writing that plan at the end of the fall semester last year. And so now we're in the process of actually implementing the plan and it touches all areas of our library. And one thing I want to highlight is that in creating the plan, 
we made sure we did outreach to specifically marginalized groups on our campus because we wanted to hear from the folks who we don't always hear from. You know, what is it they need to see our libraries do more of, stop doing, um, you know, increase access to from their perspective. So we reached out to some student of color affinity groups. We reached out to our LGBTQ plus community um, on campus, some of our international student groups um, and some of the offices that support those populations. And I think that's really important because we recognize that there are practices and past and past practices and policies and legacies of those things um, that have created harm in, in our communities uh, on our campus and have created harmful impacts that we didn't intend but are there in terms of our collections. And so we're, we're trying to address those, rectify those, and think of creative and innovative new ways to be inclusive. Um, and you know, the COVID, the pandemic, I think what it really underscored for us is that we cannot disconnect mental and physical health and well being from anti racist practice, from social justice. Like, in order for us to be healthy and well as full human beings, we have to be addressing these issues. We have to acknowledge that there's harm present and we have to do what's necessary to undo that harm. Um, so, you know, it's there's there's been a lot, <laughs> uh, I will say. And I just have to say this I hate to go back to the first question, but I really have to throw this out there because I think it's important when it comes to the labor that, that this involves. And this is for some of the folks who might be attending who, who do some of this work, know your worth. I, I think it's important to know that none of us, because of who we are, owe somebody else our experiences to educate them. We might choose to do so and other people have to recognize that that can take a lot out of us, but we don't owe anybody that we are sharing because we choose to, and, and it's important for people to be able to take the next step to educate themselves. We're informa information professionals. There's so much out there for our white colleagues where you can learn about our experiences without having to go to somebody and say, can you tell me what you're struggling with today? Because that can take a lot a lot out of a person. So I just had to add that onto the wonderful comments that um, Jamika and Romelia shared earlier. Okay, and I will stop talking now. <laughs> Is there anyone else who would like to add to this question? Um, I guess I could add, um, at our college, um, you know, what, what, due, because of COVID, we, we lost enrollment. And when we looked at the enrollment data, um, it was clear that it was our students of color who were not coming back to college, Spe specifically our Latinx and um, Black African American male students. So uh, having that process happen, I think did open up the door on our campus to really implement programs and strategies to address the needs of those particular student groups, which I think helps, has helped to try to have different conversations to implement new initiatives. Um, the other thing that I thought was, um, impactful for me at least um, on our campus I, prior to the pandemic I had been trying um, as someone you know my my dissertation research was on the digital divide in higher education and so I had an understanding of students experiences so prior to the pandemic I had been trying to implement some sort of laptop hotspot lending program at our library and, and there was a resistance or notion that it wasn't needed. I think the pandemic kind of revealed like, wait, there's a lot of communities, a lot of people out there that still don't have access to the technology, don't have access to the internet. So again, I think that was a positive. Now our library in collaboration with student services and IT, we have over 10,000 pieces of technology we're circulating. And we do have an ongoing commitment from the college to be able to continue that service even after things go back you know, to normal, whatever that might be. So those have been, I think, some good things that have come out of the whole pandemic. I mean, I know there's just tons of, um, of uh, pain and, and, and um, that has come out of the pandemic, but I, I definitely think I'm trying to look at some of the good things that have arise that allows us to advance some of our DEI and SJ work. Thank you. So let's transition a little bit with the time that we have remaining. My question is, in anti-racism, there's been a discussion about allies versus co-conspirators. 
co-conspirators are people who are actively fighting against the system of white supremacy, and in particular, the benefits that they receive from it. What are some actionable items that you would recommend for people who want to move from allies to co-conspirators? Is there work that you recommend people look at and replicate at their institutions? Okay, so um, thank you, Jenny, for that question. Um, and I'll take it, if you don't mind. So um, before I answer, I think it's important to just briefly touch on the difference between allyship and co-conspiratorship, because I don't know that everyone um, has an understanding of that. Um, and so, and why it really is necessary um, if we're committed to the authentic practice of solidarity, why we have to make the shift to co-conspiratorship. So for me, allyship can be performative. Um, it is largely rooted in, in action. Uh, it is great for virtue signaling and on social media or in the workplace, I think allyship to some degree pays lip service. So you can say to someone, I'm an ally, um, but when it requires that act, um, it doesn't happen uh, to, and conversely, co-conspiratorship, which I think we all should be trying to make the move toward, is very vocal, it's unashamed. Uh, you're not doing it for any likes. Uh, you're doing it, it's a practice that goes without acknowledgement uh, because a co-conspirator understands uh, just to kind of tie in that they're a supporting actor in a lot of ways. They're critical to the plot, but not the star of the show. And so I think it's really important for us to understand that difference between ally and co-conspirator. And so um, to really tie back to the question, if you're looking to make this shift to become a co-conspirator, here are some things that I really actively think of. Um, I think about acting as an amplifier. Uh, so a co-conspirator is a really good amplifier who knows how to walk the fine line between knowing when to speak up and when to cede the floor, uh, which we see a lot of people have a, a trouble with, uh, particularly um, acting as allies. Um, a good co-conspirator knows how to make just enough noise to get that attention. And then the moment that attention is there and it's wrapped, they will just say, here you go, here's the microphone and you, you handle it and you do what you need to do and they support that work. Um, also, I think that if you're going to be making the shift and in, in a suggestion is to kind of form a plan. And I think a lot of times there's a negative connotation tied to um, co-conspiratorship. So, um, and they reference, if you look it up, you'll co-conspirators as plotting. But to some degree, I think that whole idea of plotting, planning, ideating is a critical aspect of EDIA, uh, justice-related co-conspiratorship, because you have to ask yourself, really, as an organization, what is our mission? How do we meet that mission? What are we fighting for? And what tools do we need to succeed, right? And then finally, I'm thinking about understanding the sphere of influence. Good co-conspirators understand that sphere. They know who to make and develop meaningful partnerships with. Um, they understand the members of their community who are interested and invested. Um, they, they know internally who those people are. They know externally who those people are, and they know how to leverage those relationships. And so I think co-conspiratorship, you have to know how to do that. Build that community around you. And then finally, beyond listening, researching, and reflecting, um, the best suggestion I, I have for everyone is to be active. As I said before, it is co-conspiratorship is an act, it's a movement. You have to be willing to really get in there um, and, and do the work. And it's gonna help us to support and sustain um, everything we're trying to do. And if, please just grant me a little bit more time because I wanna say that in the question, um, it was asked if we wanted to um, replicate. And I thought about it a lot, you know, what do we need to replicate? No, we don't want to replicate anything. We want to originate. So when you're thinking about your organization, every organization has its own formula. We have our own special sauce in our organizations. So we don't really want to replicate what's going on in any other library. We want to take the time to really look at what we're doing in our organizations and create something that works for us. It may be policy development and support of hiring and retention for you. It may be programming uh, developed in concert with an organization on campus. But whatever that is, take the time to figure it out and then originate. And, and that is what co-conspiratorship is, um, that origination. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anyone else on the panel that would like to add? I just want to just echo what Christina just said about, you know, not replicating, but originating, because if we think about it, if we just replicate what other libraries are doing, we're all embedded in white supremacy culture. 
we're trying to undo that, right? That I, when I think of conspiring against, we're conspiring against like systems of power. We're conspiring against, so we shouldn't be trying to replicate. We should be trying to undo and like you said, originate. And I just have to share, this was a personal conversation I had with um, Katrina Davis Kendrick. And we were talking about this idea of peer and aspirant institutions that we're always using those phrases. Why are we always aspiring to be somebody else? Why, you know, we should aspire to be our own best selves. And I, I, I love Christina that you, you pointed that out. Thank you. I like that thought, Ioni, I really do. I think sometimes uh, being at an HBCU, they think that we can do some of this work well, and sometimes we don't do a really good job um, with that. And we, so I really like that originate. Anyone else? We have a few more minutes for this question. So I guess, um, sorry, this is kind of going back to that last question because initially I was like, well, I don't have anything to say about that, but I guess I do. So to tie these two things together for me, things that changed at my institution. One, we went from having, I think just two African-American librarians on staff to now having, I think five of us. So obviously recruitment, <laughs> we were able to recruit uh, more. That was a big part of it, right? So advocating for and bringing in um, librarians of color and not just bringing them in. Like part of what we had done before then was a lot of soul searching, if you will. Well, I didn't do a lot of soul searching. My organization did a lot of soul searching, um, met a lot and did a lot with like talking about racial battle fatigue, um, having these dialogues about, well, what does this, what does this mean when we are asking people to actually talk and unveil themselves with their experiences to perform anxiety, to perform, you know, hurt and these kind of things. So that was something that our dean and our administrative team purposefully did before bringing in more African-American librarians. I shouldn't just say African-American, but they, most of them were. So African-American librarians into the space. Um, I think the other thing that happened was as a campus, because we're so engaged with community work, that is kind of what our trademark is, we actually finally got it uh, pushed at the level of our tenure promotion and tenure system where we move to something called the integ integrative DEI case that you can now uh, go after. And so for a lot of people that are doing a lot of this DEI and social justice work, doing a lot of outreach with like local prison populations, women's shelters, et cetera, that work can finally be counted at the in ways that are helpful for them to get through and get their tenure. So I think about those kinds of big brain, I'll call it big brain moves, right? Um, and I think even on like the smaller scale, so stepping back from this idea of <clears throat> institutional power on a more local level, I think some of the things that have happened for me this last year and a half has been having colleagues be more vocal in the spaces where I'm not about my work when they speak about my work being able to speak and say like look this is I you know I talk to her all the time this is what she's doing um this is how this work matters and how it's being translated on the bigger scope because personally as someone who wasn't who's still not tenured I struggled with being put on the spot to constantly constantly discuss my work defend my work is kind of more what it felt like and I didn't want to do it so <laughs> being able to have I would say maybe co-conspirators who would do those in its spaces made it easier for me um, to sort of navigate some of the organizational challenges that I, I, I faced and I'll leave it at that <laughs> I love that you said that, Jamika, because it ties right back to that acting as amplifier. So they were really good amplifiers for you. And I think that's really important. Thank you. Anyone else? All right. My last question. How do you sustain yourself personally when you are doing this important work? 
you've given us some examples. So dig deep, help all of us on the call. What keeps you going? What advice do you have for people committing to the long haul? And what does that look like? Okay, so I guess I'm supposed to take lead on this question. Um, <laughs> so how do I sustain myself? One, um, up until this year, I was the kind of person who just kept running. Like, you know, I kept hearing this discussion about self-care and needing to implement self-care. For me, it was kind of like, oh, you know, I do self-care on the weekends. I don't, you know, whatever. I'll find time for that later. But having, now that I'm here, I kind of had a chance to pause and I realized my mental self-care, I need to practice mental self-care. And so what does that look like for me? That looks like one, maintaining, um, I call it office hours. So after a certain point, I don't do work. So not working at home. Um, that looks like aromatherapy, that looks like facials, um, that also looks like being more um, of a self-advocate in terms of expressing what my needs are. For example, like I had a conversation with my supervisor and I kind of was like, you know, it's easier for me to actually prototype a project than it is for me to kind of try to hash it out with you. Because if you, the questions you're asking, I won't know until I have a finished product. Um, but it also was kind of like basically me saying straight up, I need to be independent. Like I can't be, I don't want to be micromanaged. <laughs> and, you know, having her respect that, like just being like, oh, that's fine. Um, that's kind of, being allowed that space to play, I guess is what I'm trying to say here. Uh, so self-care, having the space to play around with what kind of projects I can do, having space to reshape my whole liaison ship model. And to do that, um, one of the things that I did was I looked, I did an assessment of my instruction and I realized, hey, I'm a, I'm a subject specialist, but my primary area doesn't require a lot of instruction. So I have a lot of downtime. And what I would like to do is to build up a support service for underrepresented students, focusing on um, helping them with their thesis level writing. And so I've been piloting that this semester. And that of course goes back to the first point I made, which is doing work that has immediate outcomes and it's beneficial. Um, the other thing with how I sustain myself, what keeps me going. I honestly love supporting research for BIPOC faculty. That is what I'm geared for. Um, the struggle was how do I do that and still do stuff like I don't care about, I, I mean, I don't know how to say it, the stuff I don't care about, like, you know, the service work that you have to do, but they don't want to credit you for so how do you get away from that? Um, I, I think I focused on things that are short term and high impact. So, <laughs> oh, this is a short, you know, I only got to do this for a year. I got to do this for six months. I can do that. <laughs> so I focused on those kind of opportunities. And I'm sorry if that's coming across kind of flippant, but I'm just on the ground. This is literally how this went. Um, and the advice for the long haul, um, Find your allies, colleagues that can work as a team. So up until this year, again, I didn't have a lot of those. With the change in the personnel, I do have a, more of a community now. Um, because of my stronger ties now with an outside program, the African American Studies program, I have a wider pool of colleagues because that recruits from everyone across the institution. So I've found my home base and I'm able to leverage my connections um, and to do work and realize not all the work that I am doing has to be done by me. Like it's okay to be a function in more of a support role. And I feel like I've been blah, blah, blah. So I feel like maybe you guys are going to sleep now because some of you guys are like, Absolutely, so I'll stop not. <laughs> Absolutely not. We need this. We want this information. <laughs> Sorry if I'm boring you guys, but like that is on the grounds, a very practical way of how I've kind of gone about it because I think to be quite honest 
I never set out, it wasn't like I set out to be like, you know what I want to do? DEI and social justice work. I just thought, I really want to support BIPOC faculty. How can I do that? And I've been just looking at different ways to do it. So I guess I more or less fell into it. And then I kind of was like, all right, this is my sweet spot. This is exactly what I want to do as a professional. And once I identified that, I constantly look for ways to, to make connections for my administrative team about why this work is important, about the major impact of XYZ thing. And that's across the board. It doesn't matter if I'm hosting a workshop, if I'm uh, recording some instruction, you know, that's kind of what I do. I'm like, I'm always making that case. And the other thing is going back to the co-conspirators. You know, I know the people in Scully comes. So I go back and I'm like, all right, what are y'all doing? Oh, y'all not hitting these people? So I translate that back to that pool of my networks. I'm like, hey, y'all, this is what we can do. This is how we can help y'all with your DASA. We can help y'all with getting grants, with data management, whatever. Like I act, I purposely act as an intermediary. I purposely act as someone who's making that connection for people. And I feel like now I should shut up because it's 241. So I'll stop talking. <laughs> Others? Uh, for me, um, I think it's important for me to, with, to sustain the work to understand the physiology that's tied to emotional labor. So I have to understand how I feel around that emotional labor that I'm, I'm kind of putting out there and all the work that you're doing around it. And so I try to stay tapped into that. I have a really strong mindfulness practice. Um, and I understand that the emotional labor is kind of tied to healing in a way. And so for me, I have to have that that the joy and I have to find ways to kind of inspire the joy so that I can be resilient so I can keep going and keep doing the work because it's not something that I want to stop ever. So I know that I have to really be in tune with how I'm feeling at any given moment uh, so that I can ensure um, that I can continue. And I would advise anyone to kind of, with when I say physiology, just understand how your body is feeling. When If you are a person who's carrying the weight of this work and you really want to be in it, um, stay in tune with how your body is feeling at any given time when you're practicing it. Um, because if you don't understand where that pain or that stress or that strain is coming from, um, it's not, it could, could be a little unhealthy. So you really want to stay in tune. And so that's what I do. Try to always stay tapped into that part of myself. Talk, tying kind of back to Amelia saying, you know, make sure you take care of yourself is really important. Also celebrate the wins. I think document and celebrate all the wins. Um, thank you, Christina. I think that, that, that was great. Um, as I said earlier, I, I don't think I do a good job in taking care of myself. Um, but, you know, listening to your comments and everyone's comments, I, I was thinking, well, what does keep me going? And I think one of the things for me is, you know, I came up with an ethnic studies and having that grounding and understanding that uh, my work is connected to a larger struggle um, and that my work is just a part of a larger history that's going to continue hopefully after I'm gone and that we're all striving to include the excluded voices. I, I think that really helps provide that grounding that I need sometimes to keep me going and to keep things um, manageable. Um, so that's on kind of like the meta uh, level. Personally, yes, I, I, I've been trying the last two or three years. It's always one of my New Year's resolutions to practice better self-care. And I write it down and I talk about it with my daughter. And yes, I'm meditation and yoga and trying to take a vacation because I don't really take a lot of time off from work. Um, the other thing is practicing daily gratitude. I think that's also helpful. Um, so I've heard, you know, I haven't. I can't say I'm a really, I'm, I'm really good at doing that. Um, but I do, I, I loved what Christina said about listening to your body because I, I do feel my body sometimes telling me like, okay, you got to stop. And, and one of the things that I look at is just how am I responding to other people when I get to the point where um, I'm not responding with care 
and compassion, then I know, okay, it's time for me to step back and take care of myself because I'm not going to be able to perform and help others if I'm just so tired that any little question is kind of not being well received. So um, listening to your body, I think is very important. Thank you. I think it is time for us to move into the question portion of the program. Um, Monica, do you have questions? I see one that I'm going to ask if, unless that's something you want to do, am I okay to move forward? Yeah, yes, thank you. Okay, uh, our first question comes from Michelle Fenton. What advice do you have for dealing with imposter syndrome? If, if I could take this one uh, first. So the very first thing I would do is go, go out and find this article by Nicola Andrews called, um, I wanna make sure that I get the title right. It was published uh, in, in the library with the lead pipe. It's called, It's Not Imposter Syndrome, um, Resisting Self-Doubt um, as Normal for Library Workers. So I think we have all felt imposter syndrome. What I love about that article is that it flips the frame and, and asks, what is it about your workplace that is creating conditions that make you feel like you're an imposter? So you are there because you, you have skills, you have expertise, you bring all of those things. What is it about your environment that is making you question? So the people on this call who are in positions of power, who are supervisors, who are managers, who are administrators, I also implore you to go read that article and there's an assessment tool at the end of it. Take that assessment tool and take a hard look at how you run things. What, what are you doing that's creating an environment where your people are not feeling good about themselves or confident about their skills, which you hired them in for, which you recognized when you brought them in. So I, I think it's the, the world doesn't make us feel like we're supposed to be here. We are. Um, so I think learning to to flip that, that frame and start asking those questions up instead of asking those questions of ourself is, is one way to start dealing with undoing imposter syndrome because it can be, it's really harmful and we really have to have, we need to be much kinder to ourselves. So I'll, I'll stop there, but that's a, I would highly recommend that article. I think a practice would be to start journaling. Um, so this is in conjunction maybe with that flipping of the question. So start journaling. When do you feel the most insecure about your work? What are the triggers? What triggers you to think that way? Is someone making comments? Is some, I tend to see a lot of competition, like, and maybe that kind of feeds into it. So start documenting the triggers. And the thing I think I would advise is in that moment, what are some things that you can do to sort of recalibrate your feelings? It doesn't have to be anything big, right? So if you're in an office space and you just left a meeting that left you feeling like, I don't know anything about my job and you come back to your office, your cubicle, what can you do? So it could be something really simple like, okay, you know what? I'm gonna take a five minute, 10 minute break. I'm just gonna pop in a podcast. Um, you know, maybe it could be something like, you know, if you have an office, I'm just gonna do a yoga pose or I'm gonna hold a pose really quick. So think about what makes you happy, what brings you joy. Um, but what at the end of that, what I want you to do is maybe journal for about a week and then analyze that, right? We're, we're librarians, we're information professionals, but also most of us tend to be really good, have really keen analytical minds. When you look at what you journaled for that week, what patterns and or trends do you see, right? Once you start seeing those patterns and trends, it's a lot easier. I think it becomes a lot easier for you to sort of start creating a counter narrative around like your insecurity. Um, I don't know. Maybe I'm just talking on the side of my face, so I'll stop talking now. <laughs> Thank you for those responses. We do have another question. Megan would like to, she would love to hear more about how white colleagues can make saying no easier. It's so important to do, and I think it can really be hard to, to do that saying no. So what suggestions do you have uh, about how white colleagues can make saying no easier? Any panelists? I'm 
I mean, I think some of it is, again, like recognizing where is their work that can be shared or redistributed. So, you know, like if, if you are somebody and you, you have a DEI project specifically, and you want to ask a colleague to, to do help work on that or, or to do that, what is something else that they're working on that you can take off their plate or that you can help them with? Maybe it's not a saying no, maybe it's a redistribution of some work so that the workload is still balanced and fair. Um, it's also being that, you know, amplifying like, I know other people who might be able to work on this project who are who are also not necessarily people of color. Maybe it's another white colleague who I know has the capacity right now and has the time that can also step in and work on this project. Maybe I'll go to that person first and preclude the you know circumstance of, of even coming up of having to force somebody to say I have to say no to this and then have them you know deal with all of those feelings. Um, you know, I just think. And again, like I, I always call out to managers and supervisors because like those are the people who really, we, we do a lot in these talks, I think about like, how can we help ourselves? And there are things, we are empowered to a certain degree to do certain things and, and ask for certain things and to advocate. But we also recognize that there are people who have more ability to do those things. And those are the people who really need to be here, listening, to be here, to take back this advice and to, to act. And so those are the folks who can say like, no, I'm going to redistribute this labor so that it's it's fair. And I'm not going to always tap the same people to do this particular sets of work. It's very powerful. Thank you. How do you manage any feelings of guilt you may have about feeling like you're not doing enough? Um, Selena says she feels like she gets pulled in many directions, but stops herself before pursuing more because she has those boundaries and energy for herself, but it's a struggle. Um, what I would say is that you, you shouldn't have to feel guilty about that. And I know it's difficult, but no, on the flip side, when we become too involved and we take on too many things, we're not going to be able to do everything. And then we're going to do a poor job. We're going to let people down. We're going to have create disappointments. So it's important that whatever we take on, it's things that we can do within our limitations. And so acknowledging we have limitations, we're human, there's only so much we can give, I think is the first part, but no, no reason to feel guilt. It's just like what you're doing, do it well, do it, you know, give it your all and acknowledge that and, and cherish that and celebrate that. You don't have to be everything to everybody. It's just impossible because again, we have to make sure that we are taking care of ourselves before we can help others. Thank you. We had a similar question from Candace. Um, how do you avoid feeling like you're not doing enough or have to prove your worth when you legitimately need to recharge? And I guess the difference would be proving your worth. Do we have anything different to add? I mean, I think I just, I, I, I said it earlier, like know your worth, you, you have worth and value just for being, you know, for being, <laughs> I mean, I think we're so driven to constantly have to do to, to prove our worth as human beings and being a human is enough and being, you know, giving ourselves space to, to rest and reflect is really important. I think, um, however we can model that for, for other people is, is important too. Like, so there's a small thing that I do. I, I schedule send on all my emails. If I do anything that it's going to go out after other people's normal work hours so that it, they get it during their normal work hours, because I don't want people to have this, feel this pressure. Like I have to always be accessible and on and have my email on my phone and, you know, notifications blowing up at me at all the time. I don't want people to feel that way. Respond in, in your time when it's convenient for you. If it's an actual emergency, which it's hard to imagine actual emergencies in a library, uh, you know, other than like the building is on fire or flooding, <laughs> um, you know, everything can wait. We all, we, again, going back to several comments from the panelists, we have to take care of ourselves. We can't do any of this work well if we're not 
taking care of ourselves physically and mentally. And, and that means giving ourselves the space and time to do so. Thank you, Ion. And to add to Ion really quickly, and I think sometimes we have to understand when we're being gaslit or minimized or diminished. And I think a lot of that plays into our feelings about ourselves. So if you're able to really get to the point where you're able to identify when that is happening, um, I think I think it goes a long way to understanding not only do you have worth, but you understand those those times in which people are attempting to make you feel like you don't. So identify when you're being gaslit. Think about that. And when you're being minimized, when am I being diminished? Take note of that. Um, I think it's going to be really important in helping you to understand you have tremendous worth. Thank you, Christina. I would like to, we have just a few minutes, but I would like to take the time to thank everyone for joining us today and to remind you that you will receive a copy of the transcript and the recording and our questions. We will send those out to everyone who signed up for this event. I would like to thank my partners on the DEI and Social Justice Committee. And I would love to say to our panelists who have taken time out of their schedule to work with us, thank you, thank you, thank you. The breath of your knowledge is very refreshing and I'm sure that we are all taking a new toolkit with us for this area. So thank you so very much for your participation. If you have additional questions, we'll be online. You can get those in the chat, but this is the end of our program. And thank you again for your participation. I hope you have a wonderfully safe and restful weekend. Thank you.